Welcome once more to Noir Alley, the dark corner of TCM devoted to the cinematic underworld known as film noir. An intriguing subset of crime films emerged and entwined with noir during the post-World War II years. They were called, for lack of a better term, semi-documentaries. And today's movie, called Northside 777, is one of the best examples of the form. It was made at 20th Century Fox in 1948 featured a great cast, topped by James Stewart, and it was released a few weeks before Mark Hellinger's The Naked City, the movie generally credited with starting the trend in semi-documentary filmmaking. What exactly did that label mean, semi-documentary? In reality, it meant little more than filming on location instead of in a studio, rather than use a backlot to depict New York, San Francisco, or in this case, Chicago, Producers began seeking greater authenticity by sending cast and crew to actual locations. This was particularly true with crime movies based on a factual story. Filming at the actual scene of the crime gave stories a greater sense of $10 word alert, verisimilitude. The trend was spurred at 20th Century Fox with the 1945 spy thriller The House on 92nd Street which essentially was a collaboration between the studio, producer Louis de Rochemont, and the FBI. De Rochemont was famous for his March of Time newsreels, which were pre-television news reports featuring documentary evidence of topical events around the world. FBI director J. Edgar Hoover co-opted de Rochemont's style to present what was essentially a promotional piece lauding the Bureau's advancement in high-tech surveillance. Labeling such films semi-documentary convinced people they were seeing the truth, even though they were watching craftily constructed fictional narratives. It was the look that mattered. The lack of studio artifice convinced people what they were watching was real. Call Northside 777 was different. Rather than being ripped from the files of the FBI, the story came from the classified ads section of the Chicago Times newspaper. That's where an item appeared on October 10th, 1944, that read in full, $5,000 reward for killers of Officer Lundy on December 9, 1932, called GRO 1758, 12 to 7 p.m. The item led Times reporter James McGuire to revisit the murder, in which two men, Joseph Maycheck and Theodore Marcinkovich, had been convicted 11 years earlier. Once McGuire learned the ad had been placed by Maycheck's mother and that she'd saved up the reward money from her job scrubbing floors, the human interest angle was too good to pass up. In truth, there were two reporters who pursued the story of Meshek and Marcinkovich's possibly wrongful conviction. But when writers Leonard Hoffman and Quentin Reynolds adapted it for the screen, they opted to simplify things by having only one convict, played by up-and-coming star Richard Conti, and a single tenacious reporter, played by Jimmy Stewart. He came on board after the original lead, Henry Fonda, chose instead to make the melodrama Daisy Kenyon with Joan Crawford and Dana Andrews. The final script is by seasoned scribes Jerome Cady and Jay Draitler. Now, unlike Fox's FBI-sanctioned semi-documentaries, this film is not about how crooks can never escape the long arm of the law. It's about how the justice system can be corrupted by the wrong arm of the law. Director Henry Hathaway was riding high when he got this assignment. He'd made, in succession, The House on 92nd Street, The Dark Corner, 13 Rue Madeleine, and Kiss of Death, all crime pictures featuring extensive location shooting. This time out, he had director of photography Joseph McDonald. They would be making the first film shot entirely on location in Chicago, as the studio is eager to point out right at the start. Co-starring Lee J. Cobb, Helen Walker, and Betty Gard, here's one of the great newspaper movies, not just of its era, but of all time. It was also the best picture winner of 1948. 
from the Mystery Writers of America. Enjoy, Call Northside 777. The screenwriters of Call Northside 777 took some liberties with the truth in retelling the story of Joseph Maycheck's wrongful conviction. The breakthrough in the case did not come from the enlargement of a photograph. That was a plot device in keeping with the studio's fascination for technological advancements. In 1948, it was preferable for a movie mystery to be resolved with forensic science than to admit the truth, that the key witness in the actual case was strong-armed into giving false evidence by the Chicago police. The reporters who undertook the investigation, James McGuire and John McFall, determined that the original trial judge, Charles Malthrop, had doubts about the convictions and told people he intended to reopen the case. But Malthrop died in 1935, and his confidants later said the judge had been warned that reopening the case would kill his prospects for political office. Less than a year after the Times reporters started digging into the case, Joseph Maycheck received a full pardon. The other convict, Ted Marcinkovich, remained behind bars another five years before he too was granted a full pardon. The role of Tilly Wycheck marked the movie debut of Kasia Orzeszewski, who didn't make many movies, but found a niche as saintly immigrant mothers. She pretty much recreated the same character the following year in Thieves Highway, and again in 1952's Deadline USA, where she testifies how the daily paper taught her not only to read and write English, but how to become a good American. Jimmy Stewart was not an actor you found in too many noir films of this era. His aw shucks honesty and forthright manner wasn't a good fit with the genre. It wasn't until he made a series of westerns in the 1950s with director Anthony Mann that Stewart went over to the dark side, playing characters driven not by decency and altruism, but by greed, jealousy, and vengeance. He wouldn't play a contemporary noir character until 1958, when he portrayed obsessive detective Scotty Ferguson in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. In the 1950s and 60s, westerns would eventually become the specialty of director Henry Hathaway, who, like Anthony Mann, had made more than his share of noir before relocating to the frontier. During his late 40s tenure at 20th Century Fox, he was the studio's go-to guy for semi-documentary crime films, the House on 92nd Street, The Dark Corner, Kiss of Death, Call Northside 777, 14 Hours, and the shot-on-location noir thriller Niagara, which shed the semi-documentary tag by being photographed in lustrous technicolor. The whole semi-documentary trend in movies died out in the early 50s as Hollywood turned to widescreen and technicolor, and on-location shooting started to become the norm, not the exception. Join me next week here at Bar 355 for a real treat, particularly if you're a fan of flashbacks. Lorraine Day, Brian Ahern, and Robert Mitchum star in The Locket, a stylish and complex psychological mystery made at RKO in 1946. It's an encore screening in honor of its writer, Norma Barsman, who passed away late last year at 103 years of age. The Locket was her first produced screenplay. Until then, see you in the shadows. Next on TCM, Vertigo, then I Confess, and later, The Entertainer. TCM shares the spotlight tonight.